He was the son and grandson of Navy admirals who served their country with distinction. Growing up, he had no doubt that his future lay in the Navy as well. He attended the Naval Academy, compiling a record memorable for its lack of academic distinction and for the trouble he caused. His career as a naval aviator got off to an inauspicious start when, sitting in the cockpit of his plane on the deck of the USS Forrestal, the plane exploded beneath him. He barely escaped with his life. Given the chance to come home, he instead requested assignment to another combat squadron. Only three months later, he was shot down over North Vietnam. He spent more than five years in a prisoner of war camp, where torture and years of solitary confinement did not break his spirit or his sense of duty. He returned an uncomfortable hero and struggled for another decade to find himself and his own way of serving his country. He is John McCain, and he is a legend of air power. John Sidney McCain III was born in the Panama Canal Zone on August 29, 1936. His grandfather was Admiral John Sidney McCain, a 1906 graduate of the Naval Academy and a stalwart of the coal-fired Navy of the early 20th century. Admiral McCain served on the battleship Connecticut in President Theodore Roosevelt's Great White Fleet, which circled the globe to show America's new ability to project its power globally. His dedication to the future of naval power was extreme, and at the age of 52, he qualified as an aircraft carrier pilot. He later served as a carrier commander during World War II and stood on the deck of the USS Missouri as the Japanese surrendered. McCain's father, John Sidney Jr., entered the Naval Academy at the ripe old age of 16 and received his commission in 1931. A heart murmur kept him out of flight training, so he entered the submarine service instead. During World War II, he commanded three different subs and sank several Japanese ships, including a destroyer. At the end of the war, he sailed his submarine triumphantly into Tokyo Bay. He rose to the rank of four-star admiral, and in his last posting at the height of the Vietnam War, commanded all American military forces in the Pacific. John Sidney McCain III was raised in a succession of Navy billets, steeped in his father's dedication to Naval service. He loved the Navy. He loved uh, everything about it. He loved going to sea in ships. Um, and he had a total commitment and dedication to the Navy. And I think deep down uh, his family came second uh, because of his devotion to the Navy. But he was a very wonderful father. and. We spent a lot of time together when he was, when he was at home, uh, and, and we got along very well. From his earliest childhood, McCain's family assumed he would, like his father and grandfather, serve in the Navy. But through the 1950s, he seemed more James Dean than a naval hero in the making. He attended 20 schools as a youth, moving from place to place as the Navy shuffled his father to different assignments. Everywhere he went, he rebelled against all manner of authority. Classmates at the Virginia boarding school his parents enrolled him in nicknamed him McNasty. I think the fact that my future was mapped out for me from the time I could talk <laughs> uh, was probably what started it. You know, the, I went to a boys' boarding school, and the other guys I graduated with went to Ivy League schools or Southern schools, and uh, I guess I, you know, I didn't, it's not that I didn't want to go to the Naval Academy. I just uh, probably wished I'd had, if I'd had the choice, I'm sure I would have chosen the Naval Academy. I just resented probably not having the choice. McCain arrived at Annapolis, a kind of crowned prince of the Navy, and almost immediately established himself as a troublemaker. He ran up near record totals of demerits and was one of the leaders of a group of midshipmen who called themselves the Bad Bunch. Their behavior was innocent by modern standards, but shocking at the time in its scorn for the puffed up self-importance of many of the upper classmen and officers around him. Uh, John nearly failed out of the academy and just barely squeaked by. But his father also just barely squeaked by as well. So it was a tradition in the family uh, to not 
invest too much of your time, effort, and treasure uh, into trying to achieve high marks, but rather try to to get through the academy experience with the least amount of effort possible and enjoy yourself as much as possible. McCain graduated in 1958 and decided to be a pilot. Not so much out of any sense of calling, but because, as he often puts it, pilots were the guys with the new cars or the best looking girlfriends. He went to flight school at Pensacola, and while his rebellious streak may have been a handicap at tradition-bound Annapolis, it proved to be an asset in the much more intense world of naval aviation. You have to be very cocky and self-assured to be a naval av aviator because especially during that time with the early jet technology really confronted death every day. Uh, just the mere process of landing on a carrier was uh, extremely risky. Though he continued to have disciplinary problems and was periodically confined to quarters for his diplomatic failures with superior officers, he was also an outstanding pilot. And he knew that like his father and grandfather before him, he would have to prove himself in combat. After completing his training, he volunteered for action in the growing war in Vietnam. I was a professional naval aviator. I was out to do the job that I was told to do and trained to do. In 1967, the Navy shipped McCain's squadron of A-4 Skyhawks to the USS Forrestal, an aircraft carrier parked in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of North Vietnam. It was the height of Operation Rolling Thunder, a campaign of bombardment that Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara believed would bring the war to an end. Every day, hundreds of American aircraft converged over North Vietnam, and every day, a few of those aircraft did not return home. John McCain arrived in Vietnam during the heat of the summer of 1967. He had been there only a short time when he learned a life-changing lesson in the horrors of combat operations. We were launching one of our first major strikes. About 30 airplanes were all going in to strike a target in uh, around Haiphong, as I remember. And uh, the uh, planes are lined up along the edges of the flight deck, and then a group of planes are in the back of the flight deck when you're getting ready to launch. By a terrible error, the, which I won't go into detail, the, the Zuni rocket was fired from the wing of an F-4, came across the flight deck and went through the 300-gallon fuel tank underneath my airplane, punched through it. Uh, the fuel spilled out on fire and spread all around the flight deck. McCain escaped by climbing out on the fuel probe at the nose of his A-4 and diving into the flames. He rolled to safety, protected by his heavy flight gear, but all around him, aircraft heavy with bombs were catching fire. He had escaped from the fire only to find himself in the frying pan. The hot metal deck of the forest stall, one of the most powerful ships in the world, was a sea of spreading flames. The ship was in deep trouble. Hampered by inadequate damage control equipment and training, it took the crew of the forest stall 12 hours of hard fighting to bring the fire under control and a full 24 hours to put the fire out. 134 sailors died in the blaze, many sacrificing themselves to help save the ship. The crew of the, of the Forrestal fought that fire with uh, some of the greatest examples of heroism, sacrifice, I think we've ever seen in the history of the Navy. And they saved the ship. McCain, one of the walking wounded, reported to sick bay in search of bandages for his burns. There he walked into a scene unlike anything he had seen before. Below decks, injured and dying sailors awaited treatment and evacuation. And I walked in and there was a lot of young men laying there very badly burned. And, and I heard one of them call to me and I went over and he was one of our plane captains and he was terribly burned and he asked about one of the pilots and I said well he was fine and he made it through and he said who was the pilot of the plane that he was the plane captain of and I said he's fine he said thank God and died right there. McCain recuperated in the Philippines. He was he says now inspired by the sacrifice of the crew of the forest stall by the pride they showed in their work and their willingness to sacrifice themselves for the sake of others. Though his injuries had earned him an exemption from combat and a trip home, he instead volunteered to return to battle. 
I was 31 years old at the time. I had been Navy, naval aviator since I was 21. I was, that was my business. The Navy assigned McCain to the USS Ariscany. Vietnam War aboard American aircraft carriers was an almost surreal mixture of onboard gentility punctuated by terrifying forays into some of the hardest combat situations ever known. Not only were they facing a devastating and effective new anti-aircraft weapon, the surface-to-air missile, they were operating under rules of engagement that seemed to take into account everything except the well-being of American pilots. In an attempt to keep the Russians and Chinese from escalating the war, American planners forbade attacking certain logical targets. Naturally, the North Vietnamese loaded those forbidden zones with war material and even air defenses. One time, one of our pilots was shot down in Haiphong. Another pilot bombed where he thought the, the uh, anti-aircraft fire came from. And because we weren't supposed to bomb inside of, Haif inside of Haiphong, he was in trouble. Well, that's not, that's not right. When McCain returned to combat, he returned to an increasingly difficult environment. New restrictions multiplied, even as the North Vietnamese increased the capabilities of their air defenses. Johnson and his advisors in the Joint Chiefs chose the targets on a day-to-day -day basis, not the operators, and it was a limited bombing campaign. His idea was not to strike the most valuable targets, uh, but to hold back on the valuable targets hoping that the Vietnamese would, would fear that those valuable targets would be destroyed unless they capitulate. The North Vietnamese, of course, fought on, protected at least in part by Lyndon Johnson's unwillingness to admit that limiting a war's scope does nothing to hasten its end. Less than three months after the fire on the USS Forrestal, John McCain suited up for his 23rd combat mission over enemy territory. He was, compared to many around him, a pilot of limited experience, who made up for his shortcomings with a drive and enthusiasm that seemed infectious. It was a major strike on, for the first time, you know, on a target downtown Hanoi, the thermal power plant in Hanoi. And there was about 26 airplanes, uh, and um, we took off and rendezvoused, and then the we came in south of Hanoi and then turned and came back in so that when we pulled off the target, we'd be headed back towards the, the Gulf of Tonkin. Three concentric rings of air defenses protected Hanoi, including both anti-aircraft artillery and surface-to-air missiles. As McCain came in over his target, his aircraft indicated it was being tracked by at least one SAM site. It's fairly easy to avoid uh, one surface-to-air missile, or even two, you can do it. But when you've got seven, eight, ten in the air at once, it gets a little more interesting. McCain continued his attack, focused on the target and his mission. He had just dropped his bombs when a missile took one of the wings off his airplane. He ejected almost instantly, breaking an arm and knee on the way out of the cramped cockpit. He landed in a lake near the center of Hanoi. A large number of people pulled me out of the lake after having some difficulty inflating my life vest because my arm's being broken. And uh, they dragged me up on the shore. Um, they began beating me and bayoneted my foot in, in, in my groin and uh, smashed my shoulder with a rifle butt. The North Vietnamese didn't know it yet, but they had captured a prize. John Sidney McCain III was not just any pilot. He was the son of the admiral in command of all American forces in the Pacific. McCain was about to feel the weight of his family's naval heritage in a way he could never have imagined before. The North Vietnamese did not think of captured American pilots as prisoners of war. Rather, in a justification that is as morally questionable as it is legally indefensible, they declared American flyers to be war criminals, which allowed them, in their own view, to handle flyers without regard for any of the Geneva Conventions. Badly injured from his ejection, badly beaten by his captors, John McCain was taken to the old French prison at the center of Hanoi, 
that had been converted to hold captured Americans. Known as the Hanoi Hilton, the prison was infamous for its cruelty. The communists wanted information. In particular, they wanted confessions of war crimes against the North Vietnamese that could be used as propaganda both in the United States and around the world. They would go to any lengths to extract those confessions, and Americans held in the Hanoi Hilton were routinely tortured, sometimes to death. I think when you're in a situation like that, you don't wonder whether you're going to live or die. You, you, you sort of try to hang on. For several days after his arrival, the North Vietnamese kept McCain on a stretcher, denying him medical treatment. They attempted to interrogate him, but he was in such bad shape that his response to questions was to simply pass out. On the third or fourth day of his captivity, McCain's captors called in a doctor, who took one look at the flyer and said that it was too late, that he was going to die. And then a few hours later, the cell opened and the interrogator, a guy we knew of called the bug, came in and said, uh, your father is a big admiral. And we're going to take you to the hospital. Uh, so it re really saved my life, the fact they found out who my father was. It also singled him out for particularly harsh treatment. The North Vietnamese knew that if they could get McCain against the war, they could reap the propaganda coup of all time. But McCain, who had long resisted even the minor exertion of authority at the Naval Academy, resisted even more fiercely the life and death power of his communist captors. The communists tried to get him to pose for pictures with actress Jane Fonda when she visited Hanoi. McCain refused. The only thing I resented about Ms. Fonda's behavior was when she sat in an anti-aircraft gun emplacement and said something like she wished that she could also shoot down an air pirate or something like that. We, we thought that was over the line. But frankly, it didn't bother us as much as you might think. I mean, after all, she's a movie actress. They offered to send him home early as a goodwill gesture to his father. Intensely aware of his family's heritage of honor and of his own duty to his fellow captives, McCain refused, saying he would accept no special treatment. Frustrated, the North Vietnamese locked McCain in solitary confinement. For two and a half years, McCain was alone. Communications. Communications are the most important thing, tapping on the walls and keeping in contact. It really is the key to it. Because as long as you feel that we're all in it together, then you can survive and resist. That's why the Vietnamese kept us in those conditions for so long, in solitary confinement or two or three to a room, is so that they could wear people down. Um, and in many ways, it's effective. Outside, the war raged on. Back home, the public will to fight broke before the spirit of the POWs did. Like many of the captives, McCain eventually signed a confession of the obvious, that he had flown missions against the North that he had bombed, that he had been, in effect, at war. Though technically a violation of the military code of conduct, the confessions were not seen by the POWs themselves, including their ranking officer and Medal of Honor recipient James Stockdale, as anything but a way of saving your own life. I think the more important issue with, uh, with the POWs is once you did sign that confession, how, f how fast, how quickly did you bounce back? and again assume a resistance posture. And according to Stocktail, that was, that was the important thing. In 1973, the American involvement in the war ended and the imprisoned pilots were released. Unlike most Vietnam veterans, they returned home amid much fanfare and celebration. Well, it took me about 45 minutes to, to put the prison experience behind me. I mean, I... I have fond memories of those I served with and the wonderful friendships I had, the rest of it, I just put behind me and I think that that's what almost all of us did. McCain returned so badly damaged that he could not resume his career as a naval aviator. He studied at the War College, was a flight instructor, and in 1977 took the job as the Navy's liaison to the United States Senate, a job his father had held 20 years earlier. It was clear at that point that his Navy career had stalled. His war injuries precluded a sea command, and his tendency to buck authority didn't endear him to the Navy brass. 
Though both his father and grandfather had risen to four-star admiral ranks, Captain McCain was passed over for promotion. He considered making politics his full-time job. He enjoyed Washington, and his gregarious personality seemed to suit the political world. He had formed close friendships with Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan, and had become a well-known and emotionally moving speaker on the Republican fundraising circuit. In 1981, his father died, freeing him, in a sense, from his naval legacy. On the day of his father's funeral, McCain signed his final discharge papers, resigning his commission in the Navy. A man who had known no real home but the Navy, he moved to his wife's home in the Arizona desert. There, far from the sea, he put down roots. John McCain's experiment with politics was, of course, successful. He was elected to the House of Representatives in 1982, and when Barry Goldwater retired, McCain ran for and won a seat in the United States Senate. His political career, like his time in the Navy, is marked by a distinct tendency to go his own way. He is no better at towing the Republican line than he was at adhering to outmoded traditions of the Naval Academy. look at the aircraft that became one of the most enduring American light attack airplanes of all time. The use of aircraft carriers during the Second World War saw the need for the development of the attack series of aircraft, also in the role of close air support of ground troops and precision attack of the opposition ground-based facilities and services. However, at the end of the Pacific War, the startling statistics of Japanese ships lost in action were tally. Of the 39 battleships and cruisers lost, four were sunk by opposition ships, eight by submarines, and an incredible 27 by air attack. The Allied attack aircraft had become a very important weapon in the U.S. inventory. Recognizing early into World War II that the SBD Douglas Dauntless was rapidly becoming obsolete, the Douglas Company started work on its replacement, the XS B2D Destroyer. During the development of the destroyer, the Navy changed its requirements and it was cancelled. Douglas went back to the drawing board and literally overnight created the drawings for the XBT2D which went into production as the AD-1 Sky Raider. The new aircraft made its maiden fight on March 18, 1945, two weeks ahead of schedule. It was the most powerful carrier-based aircraft ever built. Its single engine with its three fuselage stations and six racks on each wing could carry varied assortments of ordnance including rockets, mines, torpedoes, bombs and napalms. In fact, it could carry more ordnance weight than that of the famous Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress.
Sky Raiders went on to see combat in the Korean War, and with the outbreak of the Vietnam War, the A-1 was again pressed into service. Sky Raider flew with all branches of the service throughout the conflict and with the Vietnamese Air Force. The A-1 was a welcome sight to a downed pilot. The Sky Raiders carried out bombing strikes and close air support operations. It was used in operations against the Viet Cong strongholds in South Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. It picked up its famous call sign Sandy as an essential component in the recovery of downed aircrew. It joined a team of helicopters in the rescue effort. The A-1s provided suppressive fire on the enemy, while US Air Force Sikorsky HH-3s or Jolly Greens plucked the downed aircrew members to safety. Despite being a propeller-powered aircraft, A-1H Sky Raiders of the 77th Task Force hold the incredible feat of shooting down two MiG-17s. The Navy used the Sky Raider up until April 1968, completing over 100,000 missions in Vietnam. Their surplus Sky Raiders were turned over to the formative South Vietnamese Air Force. The US Air Force continued to use their Sky Raiders in rescue operations for a number of years. When it eventually became time to retire the A-1s, they had been so successful that they were actually replaced by three different aircraft. The A-3D Sky Warrior in the bombing mole, by far the largest and heaviest machine designed for a carrier up to that time, the Guaman Tracker in the role of anti-submarine warfare, and Douglas's A-4 Skyhawk in the attack role. The chief engineer of Douglas Aircraft's Navy plant, Edward H. Heinemann, was in 1951 one of the world's most experienced designers of combat aircraft. Many of his aircraft had been attack machines, among them the AZO Boston Havoc family, the A-26 Invader and the unmatched A-1 Sky Arena. With the establishment of the new jet age, the Navy saw that their new attack bomber would have to retain most of the abilities of their well-loved Sky Raiders and also the faster speeds now being associated with the new jet engines. The designs of the time had seen concepts becoming increasingly larger and ever more complex. Even more expensive, both for the customer and the manufacturer. In December 1951, Heinemann had rationalized a new approach to design, which took nothing for granted and tended to use new and simplified structures and systems and make every part do the work of two. The US Navy asked him to apply the philosophy to a requirement for a new attack aircraft, to fly certain specified missions at a maximum speed of 495 miles per hour and weigh not more than 30,000 pounds. In a parallel development, Lockheed and the famed Kelly Johnson were to use a similar theory or minimalist concept for their outstanding F-104 Starfighter for the interceptor role. Arneman never considered turboprops and from the start made the new attack bombers smaller than contemporary fighters. But the results were so startling they were hard to believe. Still wholly unconvinced, the Bureau of Aeronautics, or Buair, told Heinemann to double the bomb load and add 115 miles to the combat radius, perhaps hoping the whole proposal would collapse. Heinemann told them the new gross weight was 14,300 pounds. Though many of the experienced Buair staff publicly proclaimed the aircraft couldn't be built, Douglas was given an order on the 21st of June 1952 for an XA-41 prototype, 
soon followed by nine production A4D1s, each to have an empty weight of 8,136 pounds and a gross weight of 15,000 pounds. Most of the plane's concept had rested on the engine. The choice was the Wright 565, the American version of the light but powerful and efficient British Armstrong Sidley Sapphire. Using his minimalist concept, Lenneman had found that reducing the overall gross weight had allowed the aircraft to be smaller and burn less fuel. Weight savings were made in all areas, not allowing for a weapons bay save 500 pounds, making the wing with very advanced high lift devices, including groundbreaking leading edge slats, enable it to be made so small that it didn't need to fold. This saved another 250 pounds. The wing skins were made in one piece from tip to tip, and the whole wing formed an integral fuel tank. As the Navy hadn't made high speed one of their requirements, Heinemann cut out the afterburner, using alternating current electrics allowing for the use of thinner cables, designed a new lightweight ejection seat, and packaged all the various electronics into a single box pressurized with dry nitrogen and with a single multi-pin connector. The achievements in weight saving had been made without impairing the original design's concept and had in fact tremendously enhanced many aspects of the little plane's abilities and performance. The XA-4D1 was rolled out in February 1954. Douglas test pilot Bob Rahn made a most successful first flight on the 22nd of June. The Neil aircraft was a remarkable performer better precision and control power than any U.S. Navy fighter, and a much better view. The only major problem was aerodynamic bars at the tail. As a quick temporary fix, Heinemann redesigned the rudder with a single skin down the middle with half reds on each side. This was meant to be replaced by a properly engineered fix later, but nobody had time and to this day every A4D has a single surface rudder. The A4D1 went into combat service aboard carriers in October 1956 and was followed by the A4D2 with single point pressure fueling and an in flight refueling probe, as well as other changes. Heinemann had also designed a streamlined series of external bombs and tanks used on many US Navy aircraft, as well as a completely new idea. This comprised a streamlined nacelle housing fuel, a hose reel and drogue, and the necessary hydraulic drive and control system. Skyhawks were the first buddy equipped aircraft able to refuel each other. The next variant in 1959 comprised the first with limited all-weather capability, resulting in designation A4D2N. And on the 12th of July 1961, the first A4D5 started the second generation of Skyhawks with the more efficient Patton Whitney 552 two-spool turbojet engine and enhanced capability. The lower fuel consumption stretched range by some 27% and the re-engineered airframe had five stores stations instead of three and a maximum weather load raised to 8,200 pounds. And from 1962, the weather load was upgraded still further to 9,155 pounds.
With subsequent further development until 1966, the Skyhawks and Surtis were able to achieve outstanding results and were much loved by the pilots who flew. By this time though, Douglas thought the A-4 was getting to the end of the line. Heinemann left Douglas to join General Dynamics, and the US Navy wrote the VAL specification for a Skyhawk replacement, which led to the LTV A-7 Corsair II. Even the Douglas Navy plant, El Sagunda, was closed and concentrated its facilities at Long Beach, which had previously built under US Air Force machines. The new VAL requirements issued in late 1963 were for nearly double those of the Skyhawks. To speed delivery and reduce costs, all applications would have to be based on existing aircraft minimizing the Navy's risks and prototyping time by using current technologies. On February 11, 1964, Vought won, against other strong competition, the contract to develop the subsonic A7 Corsair II. Developed from the supersonic F8, interestingly, it was the first supersonic design adopted into a subsonic design. The A7 first blew on September 27, 1965 four weeks ahead of schedule and was adopted by the Air Force and Navy and went on to write its own extensive chapters in the Annals of Military Aeronautics. However, in 1965, the 2C TA-4E with the 552-8A engine started a new subfamily of tandem Skyhawks, nearly all with dual flight controls. The production TA-4E was designated TA-4F and it was produced alongside the A4F, the first of the so-called Canal Skyhawks with additional avionics in a large dorsal fairing. By 1969, production had begun on the most numerous of all late model Skyhawks, and a variant that will be around for many years in the USA. The TAU was a purpose-designed advanced trainer, which in Vietnam proved to be an excellent FAC or forward air control aircraft. In 1974, the Navy display team, the Blue Angels, took delivery of their A-4 Skyhawks in replacement of their McDonnell F-4 Phantoms. The decision was originally taken on economic grounds, but they went on to fly them for 13 years, 20 years after the Navy's final order. What the A-4 lacked in steed in comparison to the F-4, it more than made up for in aerobatic precision. The Skyhawks were finally replaced in 1987 by F-A-18 Hornets. In 1979, manufacture of new Skyhawks finally came to an end at Long Beach, 22 years later than originally planned, with total deliveries amounting to 2,405 attack aircraft and 555 two-seaters. But work on the very large number still in active service has never ceased. In 1980, the US Marine Corps introduced yet another version, the OA-4M, a dedicated two-seat FAC aircraft based on the TA-4F. There could well be further versions for electronic warfare and other missions, and for possible additional export customers. The original A-4D-1 had a weapon load of 4,000 pounds, that thought an excellent figure, especially since it had been doubled to meet the Navy's original requested specification. The modern versions can carry 3,500 pounds on the center line, 2,250 pounds on each inboard wing pylon, and 1,000 pounds on each outboard pylon, a total load of 10,000 pounds. This with a wingspan of less than that of a World War I Sopwith cannon.
When the tiny Douglas attack aircraft was only on paper, many experts said it couldn't be built. It wasn't quite the Sky Raider long haul, long endurance bomb truck the US Navy had in mind, and outwardly seemed to be too small to be useful. However, Heinemann succeeded in creating an aircraft that was small on the outside, yet gigantic in capability. To such purpose that the US Navy and US Marines pulled over 2,000 in five distinct major versions. And the average price was less than one-tenth of the cheapest 1981 aircraft to do the same job. As a mark of their true worth, the Skyhawk still flies with some of the air forces of the world. After the 1991 Desert Storm warfare, Kuwaiti Skyhawks were eventually sold to Brazil. The aircraft were delivered to Brazil in 1998 and, after extensive upgrading, became operation with the Brazilian Navy in early 2001. In its long light stand as a low-level fighter attack aircraft, the A-4 could boast capabilities needed to match almost any conceivable circumstance. After proving itself for almost half a century, the A-4 Skyhawk has more than just proven its worth. It has become one of the finest military planes ever made.